Contested Bones, Part 13. We've been looking at the uh, uh, book by uh, John Sanford, Christopher Roop, Contested Bones. Um, more information is on the website. Uh, the cover looks like this. And uh, there are Christopher Roop on the left and John Sanford on the right. To review where we've been so far, John Sanford believed in evolution until around the age of 50. Then he realized that evolution was impotent to do what was asked of it, of, and that genetic entropy was constantly fighting evolution rather overwhelmingly, and became a short age creationist. But then what do you do about all those ape to man uh, bones? And so he and one of his protégés, Chris Roop, set about to investigate. And the book that we have is the result. Chapter one discusses the advancing apes icon, the evolutionary story, and then covers some background material, scientific method, and taxonomic principles. Chapter two gives the textbook picture, which following Darwin's expectations is straight line evolution. The field is now widely acknowledged to be more bush-like, and there are some, and we're talking about evolutionists here, who uh, state that the ascent of man cannot at present be traced and may never be able to be traced. Almost all of the fossils that are supposed to show this nice, neat progression are in fact contested, which of course gives the name contested bones. Chapter three talks about Neanderthals and concludes that they're human. Chapter four concludes that Homo erectus is human. Chapter five concludes that Homo floresiensis, or the hobbit, is human. Chapter six concludes that Australopithecus afarensis, that's Lucy, is an ape. Chapter seven concludes that Ardipithecus rambidus is another ape. Uh, chapter eight concludes that Homo habilis is a mixture of ape and human bones, and therefore not an intermediate in the true sense. Chapter nine concludes the same about Australopithecus sediba. Chapter 10 concludes that Homo naledi is human, in fact, um, as human as uh, Homo erectus or Homo uh, uh, floresiensis. Chapter 11 concludes that modern humans lived alongside of apes dating back to 5.7 million years ago by conventional dating. And we are now in chapter 12. We're taking a little extra time on chapter 12, which is why 12, 13, and then 14 will be on um, chapter 12 alone. Because chapter 12 has some really tough material that I think needs to be unpacked. Chapter 12 starts out with dating methods and uh, says, do we really know how old bones are? and has a quote, sounds like faith, not science, doesn't it? Um, by uh, Clark Howell of the University of California at Berkeley. The uh, chapter starts with general comments about radiometric dating, uh, laying some of the principles, and then goes on to talk about potassium argon and argon argon dating, which we saw last, er, yeah, last week showed uh, getting zero ages on recent specimens is a problem. And if you can't measure things that are zero age is zero, how do you know the things that have a positive age are positive? And by the way, there are in the literature some negative ages, although the chapter doesn't bring it out. Um, now we move on to uranium thorium dating, which is the other major way of dating uh, hominid materials. You would think it's carbon-14 dating, but in fact it isn't, and we're going to cover why at the end. All radioisotope dating methods discussed here require the dated material to have remained a closed system throughout its existence. When dating volcanic rock, ash deposits, flowstones, etc., 
it is assumed that all daughter atoms are derived exclusively from the in situ radioactive decay of parent atoms. That is assumption two. However, the closed system assumption is routinely violated. Um, now, I will have to say that the closed system could have been violated at the time the stuff was deposited because you had daughter material with the, uh, with the parent material. So they're using closed system here in a somewhat loose way. A number of studies show that these parent-daughter systems are not effectively shielded from external processes, such as groundwater transportation, um, I corrected a small typo there, that can add or remove isotopes. This can lead to erroneous ages. The uranium thorium dating method is especially prone to this type of error, a phenomenon we will call open system behavior, which undermines the second critical assumption of radioisotope dating. Many famous hominin fossils have been found in caves that have been dated using the uranium series techniques. Either uranium, oh, there is a mutation that I didn't catch, it's uranium thorium, TH comes out, or uranium lead. For example, the recently discovered species Sediba and Naledi were found in caves, as were many other hominin bones. Most of these caves are found, formed in limestone, calcium carbonate, Anyone who has visited a cave or seen pictures will immediately recognize the stalactites and stalagmites, which are called dripstone, that are common in limestone caves. They form when water drips into caves through cracks and fissures, and there's another mutation I missed, fissures in limestone rock, leaving behind calcium carbonate deposits. Calcium carbonate can also form layered deposits on the walls and along the floors of caves. Such sheet-like deposits on the walls and floors of caves are known as flowstones. Cave deposits, both dripstone and flowstone, can be dated using the uranium thorium method, at least theoretically, also known as uranium series dating. Artifacts found in caves that have been covered by flowstone or are sandwiched between flowstone layers are assumed to have the same date as a flowstone, which makes a certain amount of sense. This includes cave wall paintings, stone tools, bones, and teeth. Uranium-234 is a radioactive isotope, half-life of 245,000 years, that decays into thorium-230, which itself is radioactive, and I'll just tell you it has a half-life that's only about 30% of that, and continues along a decay chain into the stable daughter product lead-206. Since thorium-230 is unstable, an age cannot be calculated by simply measuring the amount produced from its parent, U-234, like other conventional dating methods, um, for example, potassium-argon dating. Uh, instead, an age must be calculated based on the degree to which secular equi equilibrium has been restored between uranium-234 and thorium-230. Secular equilibrium means that for every atom of uranium-234 uh, uranium that is decaying, there will be another one of thorium-230 that is decaying. So the decay activity will be the same even though the half-lives are different. And by the way, the same will be true of there's this one radium decaying for every thorium-230 and so far down the, down the chain. Without getting any more technical, uranium thorium dating is useful for dating flowstone samples believed to be less than 500,000 years old. That's because once you get to 500,000 years, you're getting pretty close to uh, that secular equilibrium, and it gets very difficult to, to come out with dates. To date older material than this, uranium lead dating is used, discussed next. Like all dating methods, the uranium-thorium method depends on certain critical assumptions that may be false. Uranium-thorium dating is possible because of the difference in solubility between uranium and thorium. Uranium is soluble in water, dissolves readily, uh, especially in the small amounts we're talking about, and so it can be easily transported through groundwater into caves. Thorium, on the other hand, is largely insoluble, it does not dissolve in water, and tends to adsorb, or absorb, that should be adsorb, onto the surfaces of clay minerals and other particles, which reduces its mobility through soil or rock. These observations led to the primary assumption of, of uranium thorium dating. 
It is assumed that all thorium is effectively filtered out of drip water at the soil limestone boundary, or at least before it gets to the cave. And only uranium is assumed to be deposited, together with calcium carbonate, to form flowstone or dripstone. The second assumption is that the flowstone or dripstone, once it forms, is a closed system and no thorium-230 or uranium-234 exchange with the outside environment. And there's uh, something missing there because it should be, and there is no, or something like that. Under these two assumptions, any thorium-230 that is measured in a flowstone sample is assumed to be from the in-situ radioactive decay of uranium-234. However, both assumptions are unrealistic when considering any natural cave setting. Just like potassium argon dating, if there is any excess daughter product, in this case thorium-230, present in the system when the flowstone formed, this violates the first assumption. If any excess thorium was later incorporated into the system or if any uranium was washed out, this violates the second assumption. Now it's also true that if there is any uh, uranium washed in or any thorium extracted, it would also violate the second assumption, but it just creates a different uh, error in the measurement. In either case, the samples will date significantly older than their true age. A handbook from the Department of Geological Science at the University of Florida points out these two critical assumptions, and a third, the decay rate, which we will not be disputing here. Ultimately, the accuracy of these ages depends, is dependent uh, upon, one, how well the decay constants for these three nuclides are known, two, the condition that no 230 thorium, thorium-230 was initially present in the sample at the time of growth, and three, the condition that the uranium, uh, and I think that well, uranium series decay chain has remained closed, to isotopic exchange with the surrounding environment since formation. And that probably has thorium in it there too, I don't know. Um, let's consider some of the uh, conditions that might violate these critical assumptions. When water drains through surface soils, overlying caves, and carries new minerals into the cave, this is known as leaching. While it is true that thorium by itself is insoluble and not directly leachable from the soil, thorium uh, can bind to other minerals or molecules that are soluble and hence be transported into a cave or also small particles can be transported with, with, the, uh, with the flow of water. The principal constituent of limestone is calcium carbonate and calcium carbonate plus water gives rise to the carbonate ion. It is acknowledged that the presence of ions or ligands and Carbonate ion is specifically mentioned, and also humic matter, we're going to come to that in a little bit, that can form soluble complexes with thorium should increase its mobility in soil, and also in caves. This means thorium can in fact be carried or leached from the surface soils and surrounding rocks into caves. And this invalidates the primary assumption of uranium thorium dating. The following statement made by George Save et al. in the Journal Quaternary International, it's a fascinating um, article, reflects this common assumption, which they challenge in their paper. Calcite incorporates some uranium when it crystallizes because uranium cons compounds are soluble in water, and they also can fit in the place of calcium, the uranium can. But no thorium compounds, which are insoluble. At this moment, the meter is set to zero. Now this is their statement of the hypothesis, by the way, not how, what they think is actually happening, as we'll find out. The, research, the researchers go on to explain that several sources of error may s seriously undermine this method. Calcite may behave as an open system. In that case, uranium removal or thorium input could lead to overestimation of the age. Now it could also lead to underestimated of the age if you have uranium adding or thorium removal. Indeed, thorium isotopes can be brought into solution and leached into caves. Um, and this is a quote again, the, the contamination of groundwater through the transport of thorium from soil to groundwater will not occur in most soils 
except soils that have low sorption characteristics and have the capacity, capability to form soluble complexes. Chelating agents, organic compounds, produced by certain microorganisms, Pseudomonas aeruginosa in particular, present in soils may enhance dissolution of thorium in soils, and they have a reference for that. Luritzis also shows that thorium can be transported into caves by water. Many elements that are picked up in solution as a result of acid leaching in soil zone, for example, silicon, aluminum, sodium, potassium, will remain in solution when calcium carbonate is precipitated. A detrital calcite will contain soil particles, and this imposes serious problems into the dating, as the conditions of closed system is no longer valid, and thorium isotopes will participate in the initial calcitic deposit. And suddenly, you have a, a date that has built-in age. Detrital calcite, uh, I'm gonna have to say that this is a little bit unclear here, Detrital calcite is a form of calcium carbonate associated with biodegradation of organic matter by microorganisms. Detritus, and humus is not the only detritus. Uh, it could, or detritus, some people will say. Um, it can be such things as small clay particles, and the flowstone contains a small amount of that. And so uh, that those can have thorium adsorbed on them, and then uh, give you initial thorium concentrations that are non-zero. Um, so they had all report on the surprisingly high solubility of thorium when bound to certain salts. A spectacular confirmation of 230, uh, thorium 230 solubility was given by Whitehead et al. A contemporary st stalactite that is less than a century old, that could be assimilated to zero age, was sampled in a cave of New Zealand and gave a uranium thorium age of 3,520 plus or minus 170 kilo years. Now, if you realize that that would be past the, uh, the ability of the measurement, you realize that um, something is wrong here I was able to look up the original article, and there is a misprint. That is not kilo years, it is actually years. So it's 3,000 years, mm, plus or minus. Um, it's still kind of striking. What it means is that this stuff, if you were to date it, that stalactite, you would say that its actual age was well before the time of Christ, in fact, uh, before the exile, before, uh, before the time of David. As thorium-232 is virtually absent, thorium could not come from detrital particles, see, because detrital particles presumably already have uh, thorium of various kinds adsorbed to them, 230 and 232 but was incorporated as soluble salts, probably organic ones. This study demonstrates that soluble uh, thorium-232 may be co-precipitated with calcite at the very moment of its formation, given a, a false age of a few thousands of years, which makes sense. Not, it's not a few millions of years. We cannot reject the hypothesis that thorium-232, present in the limestone of the cave, continues to percolate through the porosity and to accumulate during the growth of the speleothem, leading to increasingly erroneous ages. It is clear that there are multiple ways that thorium can be incorporated into drip water. I'm not <laughs> gonna go through the whole list. None of these conditions are unusual and all will tend to give old dates for young rock. Any attempt to detect excess thorium, thorium-230, that did not derive from the insight to radioactive decay of uranium-234 requires additional complicating assumptions. For example, the detection of initial or detrital thorium-230 is based on the simultaneous measurements of the longer-lived thorium-232 isotope, which is actually longer-lived than the uranium-238 um, 
It's a long time. Um, that is presumed to have been initially present in the system. This, of course, is only possible given the shaky assumption that thorium-230 exists in constant proportion with thorium-232 in any natural setting over time. One of the possible reasons for uh, leading to age overestimation is the presence of thorium trapped in calcite during crystallization. As thorium is presumed to be insoluble, it would have been embedded in solid particles and detrital materials such as salt or clay. In such particles, both isotopes of thorium, thorium-230 and thorium-232, are assumed to be present in their natural pro uh, proportions. Uh, Pentecost acknowledges the difficulties with detecting excess detrital thorium. Since most travertines contain a few percent detrital material, that's right, one to five percent. So it's a significant portion of travertine has this little clay stuff coming through. Uh, the selection of samples is crucial. Fortunately, detrital thorium can be detected as it occurs with thorium-232, but corrections are sometimes difficult and may not be very reliable. Well, that's true if the, there's thorium-232 uh, in significant amounts in the same uh, stuff that's bringing in the uranium. But if the uranium is relatively pure to begin with, without thorium-232, then the thorium-2, uh, pardon me, without thorium-230 in it, then the thorium-232 that comes through is now going to uh, be unassociated with thorium-232, and so then the correction will be completely off. So et al. in Quarterly International uh, Journal, and that really should be the, well, provide an eye-opening explanation of an alternative source of excess thorium-230 that is much harder to detect than detrital sources. Correction for detrital thorium containing particles is standard for practice for specialists. However, there is another source of error, much more confusing, because it is captious, and I think that this, uh, if you're going, what? What does captious mean? It's an unusual word, and it usually means complaining about uh, things of not very much significance, uh, nitpicking. But, in fact, the, it's from an old French word, which means deceptive. And I suspect that um, this was because Salve is, I think, French, uh, and, and the, in fact, the whole group is French that I suspect that they used the French word and then translated it into English and it was close enough and so they used it. So what I think what they're saying is is much more confusing because it is deceptive and difficult to detect. This derived from the opening of the system after the deposition of calcite. This cause of error is well known in the case of corals but much more difficult to detect in the case of speleothems. The possibility of such error is seldom mentioned in spite of well-documented examples. An input of uh, thorium-230 seems more probable as, contrary to what is usually claimed, thorium-230 is not rigorously insoluble, particularly when occurring as salts of organic acids such as fulvic and humic acid. The introduction of a very small quantity of thorium-230, not correlated with the incorporation of detrital thorium, may be responsible for the thorium-230 uh, over uranium-234 activity ratios that are greater than one. That shouldn't be able to happen, but it does. And the article that we're talking about shows some of that data. The same phenomenon probably also takes place when this ratio is lower than one, causing an overestimation of the age. Perfectly reasonable. Oh, by the way, this is humic acid, and you will notice that there are a couple of amino acids stuck in and they don't really specify which ones they are, so this is not a, an absolute formula. And also that there are a couple of areas there and there where uh, those things uh, can be connected to other uh, molecules, maybe of humic acid, maybe of something else. These researchers cite convincing evidence indicative of open system behavior. They found that excess thorium-230 
is introduced into the system after initial flow stone de deposition, resulting in an overestimation of a sample's age. Uranium loss through leaching is another problem for uranium thorium dating that can result in exaggerated ages. For example, one source says Clark et al. found evidence of uranium loss by natural travertine dissolution. Now, before I go on, how do they find that evidence? Have they watched the uranium go out? No. What's actually happened is they're getting ages that they don't believe, so they think, well, it must have had uranium leaching. You have to be very careful. When people say stuff in this, you need to ask, how do they know that? And oftentimes, uh, there's a lot of theory behind how they know that, and it eventually comes to uh, they're not getting the dates they expect. Salve and colleagues, uh, again, will say, moreover, a much more serious but rarely considered source of error contradicts the assumption of a closed system. In thin layers of carbonate deposits and in damp media, the uranium incorporated into the calcite during its crystallization may be partly eliminated because of its solubility in water. Again, this is not tested by putting, let's say, distilled water uh, or water from a cave in, onto travertine and see if the uranium comes out. This is just because, theoretically, it could give the result, and, and the result is there, so it must have happened. Uranium leaching causes an artificial increase of the age that may reach considerable proportions. For example, a negative hand in a cave in Borneo was dated to 27,000 years by uranium thorium, whereas its carbon-14 age was only 8 to 10,000 calibrated before present. Now, you're starting to see some of the problems that are involved. You have two different dates that, that don't match each other, and the question is, which one of them do you believe? Both of them have fudge factors, so it depends on you know, what you think the, the, cave, uh, the negative hand really should be. In this case, the people who wrote this think the negative hand really should be somewhere around eight to 10,000 calibrated before present. And therefore, the 27,000 year just has to be erroneous. And so we'll find a reason not to believe it. To move on to uranium lead dating, uranium thorium dating is useful for dating cave deposits less than 500,000 years old. Remember, remember that, the misprint made that other one five million years old. To date hominin bearing cave deposits older than this uranium lead dating, pardon me, to date hominin bearing cave deposits older than this, uranium lead dating is a method of choice. Yet uranium lead dating suffers from the same problem as seen with uranium thorium dating, open system behavior. That is, mobility of uranium, thorium, and lead leading to exaggerated ages. As a doctoral thesis on this topic acknowledges, boy, why they even read that thing is amazing. The doctoral theses are like hundreds of pages. Um, published studies in the area, that is South African hominin sites, have revealed major uranium-234 excess in groundwater and speleothem. Where conventional age calculations are used, this effect could result in an age much greater than the true age. Surprisingly, fundamental processes involving the uranium, in uranium lead dating, such as the movement of lead in the environment and how it incorporates into flowstone, are not well understood. Woodhead et al. acknowledged this in quaternary ge uh, geology. Controls on the movement of lead in the environment and its incorporated in the calcite are relatively poorly known. Most lead salts with common anions are only slightly soluble and the average concentration in river water is less than 100 parts per trillion and just a few parts per trillion in ocean water. Lead is incorporated into the calcite structure, but given lead uh, two's relative insolubility, most natural calcites should have l relatively low levels of lead. So we hope that you didn't get any lead in this stuff. Adsorption and complexation with iron and mag manganese oxides and organic matter, um, however, may promote lead mobilization and subsequent availability. 
Alternatively, lead may be incorporated into speleothems associated with fine detrital particles or as submicron sized colloids. Aware of the problem of open system behavior, geochronologists devise complex models to account for uranium thorium lead loss and uptake. These hotly contested models are continually revised or replaced by promising new models. Models are needed because dated carbon and samples from caves contain a mixture of radiogenic lead and non-radiogenic or common lead. That means some lead from the outside that, that is not lead 206, that may be, for example, lead 207 or lead 204. Non-radiogenic lead from the environment can also be added to a sample during pre a sample preparation in the laboratory. And one of the problems with lead is that depending on where the source is, it will have higher ratios or lower ratios of lead 206 to 207 to 204. Um, and so it can be kind of a confusing as to which uh, lead your, uh, you know, what the composition of the original lead was. Um, and so now your model is going to have to work that in. And, you know, if your model gives you the date you want, you like it. If the model doesn't give you the date you want, you don't like it. And if the model gives you some dates that you like and some dates you doesn't, that you don't like, then it works over here, but it doesn't work over there. So now you need a new model for over there. Since radiogenic lead, in this particular case, lead 206, and non-radiogenic lead, which can also have 206 in it, are analytically indistinguishable, researchers have to indirectly determine which lead isotopes derived from the in situ cave decay of uranium and which did not. This distinction is made by using other isotopes, for example, thorium, or other isotopes of, uranium, uh, of, of lead as a proxy for estimating the initial amount of lead in a sample at the time of flowstone formation. This requires additional assumptions about past conditions that are continually debated by experts. For, for instance, Woodhead et al. write, We've argued previously, Woodhead et al., 2006, that compilations of speleothem, uranium, and lead concentration data derived from the literature and as measured by conventional ICPMS or other instrumental methods may seriously overestimate the lead abundance in many samples. This possibility arises from the ubiquitous contamination of anthropogenic lead in the environment. That's stuff that we did. Um, and part of it's from the tetraethyl lead that used to be in lead, leaded gasoline. You, some of you may remember that. Um, and the fact that micrograms of this lead can be easily added to a sample by simple crushing and handling. So you're not careful, you don't have your hands and your instruments clean, suddenly you've got lead into your, in your system that you hadn't figured on. In many cases, the lead blank added during such procedures is orders of magnitude above the natural lead content of typical samples. So you can imagine trying to figure out how much of that is really in the sample itself. In an attempt to circumvent this problem, Woodhead et al. employed thorium as a proxy for lead content using an assumed crustal lead, uh, thorium to lead ratio, which of course has its own problems, and suggested that a typical lead content for many speleothems may be less than 100 parts per billion. Now you can see why, you know, wiping your leaded hands on something like that might very well just completely overwhelm the system. Um, 100 parts per billion with uranium uh, 238 to lead 204 ratios in the 10 to the two, uh, 2 to 10 to the 6th range, many of which would be uh, suitable for uranium lead geochronology. This hypothesis was not an ideal construct, however, since it relied on thorium as a proxy for lead content, and of course, that's not necessarily true. In an attempt to avoid these problems, geochronologists have developed complex pre-screening procedures to ensure that they are choosing only the best samples. The problem is there are very few ideal flowstone samples when it comes to dating hominids. 
Most all samples are expected to contain initial amounts of non-radiogenic lead, detrital thorium, and excess uranium, and apparently soluble thorium as well. To date, over 600 uh, hominin fossils have been discovered in South Africa in various caves, the richest collection outside the East African rift system. All of these cave settings are open systems such that even a tiny bit of excess common lead, if mistaken for radiogenic lead, will result in greatly exaggerated ages. The bottom line is no one is present long ago to measure the initial conditions, uh, that is the initial isotopic concentrations of a given cave system. Therefore, there is no way to directly verify whether or not, let alone how much, uranium, thorium, or lead was initially present, or whether the system has always remained closed throughout its history. Consequently, any hominin bones or artifacts that have been found in caves that have been dated using the uranium, thorium, or uranium lead methods are inherently uncertain. The actual age of all such hominin bones that have been dated using these methods, which includes Neanderthals, Erectus, Hobbit, Sidibe, Naledi, etc., are very likely significantly younger than their reported ages. So that's kind of his answer, or their answer. You really don't know what you're dealing with, and there's no particular reason to choose uh, one dating system over the other based on these methods. Actually, sometimes the dates are low, and they kind of try to ignore that. Carbon-14, a serious challenge to the hominin timescale. Most people are confused about carbon-14 dating. It is often thought that carbon-14 shows how very old things are. Actually, carbon-14 usually shows us how young things are. Carbon-14 mostly arises in the upper atmosphere where cosmic rays turn nitrogen into carbon-14. The resulting carbon-14 immediately begins to revert back to nitrogen. Some of this carbon-14 enters into living plants and animals. Because carbon-14 no longer enters living things after they die, the carbon-14 clock starts ticking at death. Uh, the carbon-14 in a biological sample disappears at a very steady rate, with its half-life being just 5,730 years. This means that no detectable carbon-14 should remain in any biological remains after about 100,000 years certainly by the methods that we have today. It is remarkable, but essentially everything in the fossil record contains measurable levels of carbon-14. And at this point, I'm going to pull down the, uh, the note because uh, uh, for a list of 90 peer-reviewed journal articles reporting measured amounts of carbon-14 in samples from every part of the Panazoic record, see the table compiled by P. Geem, that's me, and D.R. Humphrey et al. in the following report, and it's actually Baumgartner is the one who wrote the, that, this article in the book himself. So, this is one that I'm somewhat familiar with, shall we say. Um, this seems contrary to popular wisdom, but is widely recognized within the carbon-14 community. Taken at face value, this suggests that the entire fossil, fossil record is less than 100,000 years old. Many will be offended by this idea, but like it or not, this is what the carbon-14 dating appears to be showing. And I would have to agree with that. When bones of the Homo genus have been carbon-14 dated, they have consistently yielded the young dates, ranging from thousands to tens of thousands of years. Remember that controversy where the one was, what, 8 to 11, depending on what you do with certain things? And the, it's actually 8,000, and they're adding a fudge factor because they know that there's some extra old uh, carb uh, calcium carbonate that's being deposited. Uh, but the, the uh, uranium therm date was 27,000 years, remember that? Um, I, they give an example here. It appears that Naledi has been carbon dated, but the resulting dates, 33 to 35,000 years old, which are easily within the range of modern machines, were rejected because the dates conflicted with other dating methods and so were assumed to be caused by contamination. And instead they said these things were about 300,000 years old. Um, but maybe they are only 30,000 years old and the, and the other dating methods are flawed. And maybe they're even younger than that because carbon-14 exaggerates the age as well. 
We suggest that many more hominin bones should be carbon-14 dated, including bones of the genus Australopithecus. And again, I would agree wholeheartedly. I think carbon-14 dating has not been used for much of this because they're sure that, that it has to be older than carbon-14 can reach, and so nobody bothers to try. Some will argue that any carbon-14 detected in fossils must be modern carbon that has somehow infiltrated the sample. Um, in fact, many will argue that because they know that the other answer is that it isn't that old. And that's an answer they aren't willing to accept. Three lines of evidence suggest that this is not the case. Firstly, the carbon-14 level in biological samples of the same type buried at the same time are remarkably consistent. Uh, if it's infiltrating, you'd expect some bones to get worse than others. Uh, secondly, many samples such as coal deposits are too massive and too deeply buried to be significantly contaminated by modern carbon. Think about how much carbon-14 you have to turn into a coal seam. And it turns out to be a huge number. And you have to do it in the last 6,000 years or otherwise um, it would all decay away anyway. So, or uh, half of it would decay away anyway, and so the, uh, every time you turn it in, you, ha you have to turn in more and more, and by the time you're talking 45, 50,000 years, suddenly you have to replace the entire coal deposit at that point, which is nuts. Thirdly, carbon samples not subject to internal contamination, such as diamond, still reveal measurable levels of carbon-14. That was a stunner. I was not expecting that when I advocated that they try doing diamond, but it's true. Some have argued that new carbon-14 may have been created by heavy radiation of biological samples by nearly nearby uranium deposits. However, uranium deposits are ubiquitous and radiation could never be intense enough to create carbon-14 faster than it decays. The problem is that carbon-14 keeps decaying. Geophysicist John Baumgartner directly responds to this objection as well, both in his technical report on this, uh, on this topic and through personal communication with the authors of this book. They were doing this and they called him up and they said, hey, what about this? And his comment is, the currently measured rates of uranium, and there's another mutation there, thorium decay, um, are too small to generate any significant amounts of carbon-14 in these contexts, so that any attempt to explain the measured carbon-14 levels, such as we and others have reported for coal by this mechanism, is hopeless. I would agree with him on that, too. One way that geochronologists have tried to bring carbon-14 dates into alignment with the hominin timeline has been to add a control, such as natural gas, to each experiment, and then reduce the carbon-14 levels of a sample by the amount of carbon-14 in the natural gas, um, which is actually reasonable given their assumptions, except that this is, the assumption is that natural gas is too old to retain carbon-14, and so any carbon-14 in it must be contamination, but as we will find out, the problem with this report approach is that natural gas is not a fair control. It contains highly reproducible levels of carbon-14, which has been reported now in the creationist literature, but hasn't made it into much of the other literature. Um, a ubiquitous carbon-14 throughout the fossil record is very, re is, is very real, that should read, I'm sure, and brings into question standard timelines. Now, my take on all this is, regarding uranium thorium dating, the points that are made are true. But they do miss part of the picture. You can find in the literature complaints that thorium can be leached to uranium added to the sample as well, which implies that some dates are too young to fit the standard geological time scale. And I'm raising the question, maybe there isn't as much of that happening. Maybe they really are younger than everybody expects. It is logical that this could be the case, but the problem threatens to turn uranium-thorium dating into a completely useless endeavor. And let me explain. If one likes a date, one keeps it. If one doesn't like the date, one argues for either initial thorium or open system behavior. So the date cannot tell us anything we don't already know, in which case it is quite literally useless. 
I'm not saying that the method is worthless and should be scrapped, but I'm saying that if we aggressively filter data by theory, the resulting filtered data is worthless as a support for that theory. The same is true even more for the uranium lead method as lead is more soluble than thorium under most circumstances and certainly could contaminate um, speleothem as it is being produced. One more point, I don't think we should be satisfied with simply trashing the data. We may have to be for now and it's a reasonable first approach. But I think we should be proposing experiments where our theory, and eventually we should have one, can be tested against the standard model. That is the essence of science. In the case of carbon-14 dating, the evidence fairly considered seems to argue for a shortage for life on Earth. I think there's still more work to be done I think samples, for example, with physical controls rather than historical controls need to be run. That was a sad chapter, although it's not entirely uh, the uh, creationist's fault. The people who ran the lab didn't want. And it was actually, that blew it for them. Because if they, if they had not done historical, if they had not used historical controls, nobody could, t could have told which lab it was and as it was, they lost their funding. Samples of coal seams with uranium content measured from different areas of the seam and different nitrogen content should be attempted. The nitrogen content to control for how much, uh, how many neutrons might be around and uh, the uranium content to find out uh, whether direct production or neutrons could possibly account for the small but fairly consistent amounts of carbon-14 in coal. But if one considers the data we have, I think it does point to short age. Unfortunately, the era of cooperation between long age and short age advocates appears to be ending. I hope either that this is not the case and we can find some place in, uh, who knows, Poland or, or uh, Russia or China or something like that where dogmatism is not as much of a problem, um, or else that creationists can create, create their own laboratory, and I'm preparing for that possibility. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. Oh, we have a. Yeah, the the um, excess carbon, if you want to use that term, carbon-14 in uh, old samples, uh, that uh, uh, to me the uh, more convincing argument of that whole thing is that they have hardly been able to find any sample anywhere that doesn't have some carbon-14 in it. Yes, that's, that is no. the case. Now you can holler contamination and uh, they gave three different reasons why you shouldn't believe in contamination. I thought I'd add one more experiment and that is uh, using uh, radiolarians uh, uh, testing for that had excess carbon-14 in them. Yeah. They tested, they found that uh, the carbon 14 was throughout the whole thing, indicating that this was incorporated in the whole body of the radiolarian. This was not surface contamination. Yes. And um, I they found the same thing for shells, by the way, where they took the inside yeah. of the shell, the outside of the shell. It didn't matter. The, the experiments seem to show you that this is not contamination. It's it's built in in the sample and it represents uh, what was originally there. Yeah, but it, uh, I refer to that in an article that of mine had published uh, this last month. Uh, uh, this is this is a significant thing. I it, it, I think it we need to keep in mind. You know, the hundreds of thousands of these radiometric dates are older than uh, carbon fourteen shows, and yep. uh, it's something we need to work on. 
Yeah. Well, you know, one of the ways to find out how much contamination you have is to simply take um, mm -hmm. a material that you can date to have a certain age and then run it through the purification process and turn it back into the same material again and see whether the cycling through adds uh, extra carbon-14. Now this has been done in three labs that I know of, um, two of which had significant amounts of carbon-14 added. Um, but one of which, interestingly enough, did not. Probably what I consider the best lab in the world right now for getting down to uh, baseline levels, and that's uh, in Australia. And they had some special equipment, which I think probably changed that. Now, people aren't publishing this stuff as much anymore. <coughs> they have a, um, a lab in, um, uh, in Ottawa, Canada, which I visited. Uh, and they tell me that they don't have a problem with uh, contamination during their, uh, uh, during their cycle. They're not saying too much about doing very old samples anymore. So I don't know wh whether they've, you know, whether they've actually corrected the problem or, um, uh, one of the things, this is kind of tedious work, going through the literature, reading it, <coughs> understanding what they're doing, um, and then uh, trying to figure out exactly how much carbon-14 they have in old samples. Um, in, in some ways, it'd be far easier to just simply start with samples and, and do the experiments yourself. Um, and in, in an ideal world, one could just simply do that. Unfortunately, uh, it doesn't appear that we have what one would call an ideal world, and so uh, we may have to be, you know, have some kind of control over a machine before we can do some of these experiments. But uh, comment here, and then uh, Nick. Um, so, would it be possible to apply two different uh, dating methods to a sample? And then if they agree, then that would give indication that there was not the same, you, you would not expect the same level of contamination? Am I, do you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, I do. And, and this is what's off, often put off uh, as, well, but the, the, the samples agree. Uh, you send it to potassium argon dating, you get a date. You can send it fission track dating, you get a date. You put it magnetic uh, paleomagnetism and you get a date and they all match pretty well. Um, let, let us just say that next week we're going to deal with a classic important and therefore I think in an important way not cherry picked. Um, case where the data came in, in, in one direction, it conflicted with uh, evolutionary theory, and people found ways to discount the old dates and get new dates. Uh, in that case, at least, radiometric dating of several different kinds turned out to have what uh, people sometimes call a wax nose. Could be bent in any position you want. Um, in fact, uh, given the size of what was, being, what was happening, you could fairly call it a wax body. Uh, it was, it's incredible what, what was done. And when you see it, you begin to realize that even concordant dates are not the absolute. That, and there's still people whining that the concordant dates that they got the first time were really true. And it's all these new people that are cherry picking the data. 
Well, I like I say, it is fascinating, and it, what really should be happening is these things should be done, and then, so to speak, the answer key pulled out. This is the one thing they really don't want to do. Now, you know, you and I, are, uh, being physicians, are quite acquainted with, you know, you send the uh, sample out to the lab and you want to know what the hemoglobin is, or, you know, you want to know what the white blood count is. And there's certain things that they'll tell you if, if you're doing potassium and you see supernatant that's pink, don't measure it or at least report it with a caveat that is probably too high because that's a bad specimen. Um, but what we're going to see is people saying that yes, your specimens looked perfect, but they gave the wrong dates, therefore they must be wrong. And you know, at that point, really, theory has a veto over evidence. And that's not the way science is supposed to work. Come back next week, in, or, or if you can't, uh, watch on video, and we'll get in to see that, because it is striking. I agree with you that, you know, you measure it in two or three different ways. You would think that that should be pretty much settle it. But actually no comment uh, here oh. oh I'm sorry Nick first yes correct uh, I was watching a video uh, showing all the artifacts found in the tombs of Egyptian tombs of Tutankhamun and so on yes I was wondering, uh, did the, these experts, any of these experts, evolutionists, did they date those artifacts? And if my question is, what age do they assign to those artifacts? And uh, I'm wondering about the, the tombs of the Aztecs and other historical events that we probably know the age. Now, if in the event it is, we can assure that consistently we get the wrong ages, then I would say, what's the point of relying so much on carbon-14? In other words, science tells me that there should be at least validation how do you validate a date assigned for millions of years? How do, how do you validate that? Well, for millions of years, you can't, really. So if you can, what's the point? If we cannot, it's not science. Science is supposed to be subject to validation, verification. Where is the science? The, the only validation that you can really do is to, is to make sure that your thing works for, z for zero age specimens. So if you come across a stalactite that's hanging from a bridge that was built in 1948, and there are some of those, <laughs> and you date it, and it's 3,000 years old by, by, uh, uh, by uranium thorium, at that point, until you can figure out exactly what it is that made the date that erroneous, dates that are 3,000 years or less uh, are totally worthless. Uh, dates that are 3,000 years or more are possibly worthless. Certainly wouldn't want to hang your life on it. You wouldn't want to rest your eternal destiny on it. Um, if you have potassium argon ages of lava flows that flowed in 1910, or for that matter in 
2018, as there are a few of them up in Kilauea right now. And you date those things to 1 million, 2 million, 20 million, 40 million years old. I don't think you can trust potassium argon beyond about 40 million years, or, or less than 40 million years. And you have to worry about what's happening before that. When you read, which we will read next week, that you have 200 million year old lava, that they say, no, it can't be, it's really only 2 million years old. And they just toss it out. Even though you can't see why the, sa the samples are particularly bad. Now I'm starting to say, what's the point of potassium argon dating at all? So, Yeah, it's a problem. And at this point, like I say, I wouldn't bet a nickel on it, let alone my eternal destiny. And yet that's what some people are asking me to do. Don't believe the Bible because it conflicts with potassium argon dating. That's to be very blunt, that's what they're saying. Well, it's all the other evidence. Well, as you're going to see, all the other evidence can be moved from one position to another. Check back next week. It is jaw-dropping. Um, not to say that the people that are doing it aren't doing the best they know how. It's just that the best they know how happens to include that the Bible is wrong. And if you're using that material to test what the Bible says, it's bad precedent. If you start out by assuming the Bible is wrong, and then you find all this wonderful stuff, and then you take that evidence and go back and say, well, see, oh, well, the evidence that we collected shows the Bible is wrong, that's not a good logical way of approaching things. I know it's hard because we grow up in a society where you send off blood tests and they tell you that your DNA has this or they tell you that you have a low hemoglobin or a high potassium or a, and, and there are real world consequences to that and you live with them and you know what? They're right 99 something percent of the time. We are used to laboratory tests actually meaning something. We are used to measurements that are precise to the nearest, you know, um, now like two feet, as to far, far apart the sun and the, uh, or the moon and the earth are. We're used to using that kind of precision. What's happened is that people have transferred that to systems where you can't test and when you do the only test you really can, which is zero age read zero, it doesn't work. Or at least there's a significant proportion of the time where it doesn't work. Um, don't build your life around potassium argon dating or uranium lead dating or fish and track dating, or as we will see next week, all three of them put together. Because the overwhelming filter is, is this stuff old enough for our theories and young enough for our theories? Does it get the date we want? And if that overrides all the evidence, then um, you're asking, basically, if I start out by presuming the Bible is wrong, then um, is the Bible wrong? 
And of course the answer is yes, but you assumed your conclusion. That's not logical. That's not even fair. Yes. I, w <clears throat> I guess I've gotten out of date. I was unaware that carbon-14 is found in most of these old samples. It isn't widely known in the, in the regular community. What I was listening for today, and maybe we'll hear it next week, is a comparison of a carbon-14 date with carbon using that, that system and the others at the same time. If it's present there, that should be doable. Why, why aren't we hearing about it? because nobody wastes their time on a dating method that they are sure will give them basically infinite age. But certainly creationists would be bannering this everywhere. Well, with real measurements. Some creationists have. Um, I published that list that they uh, mm -hmm. cited uh, Baumgartner and company uh, took most of my list, put a few things in, uh, took one or two things out because my list was intended to be comprehensive, theirs is uh, intended to be illustrative. Um, <laughs> uh, and and the, the ones that they added are basically fair. Um, then after they had the list, they decided to do coal samples. And that's been published. You know what? Uh, maybe when we get done with all this, uh, we'll go over uh, the history of carbon-14 dating uh, in a little more detail because obviously it's not getting through to some people. I don't think you're alone in this. Well, having lived with these with with these topics for a long time in important ways, uh, I guess the one hole in my understanding was that carbon fourteen was there in old samples. Yes, it is. Because I've always read and heard that it is absent. Uh, Okay, yes, we should go through the entire <laughs> list, we, or at least enough of it to be illustrative. Um, and like I say, I did what was intended to be comprehensive. It wasn't quite, but it was mm -hmm. pretty close. And, and the, the, the pieces that, one of the pieces that was left out was mm -hmm. even better than, than what my list was. Um, and then we've created new data since then. People have done this with, uh, with oil. Uh, with natural gas. Um, uh, and the most recent one is with dinosaur bones. And that's when the thing blew up, is because the University of Georgia refused to do any more business with the people who were doing dinosaur bones. Absolutely refused. Beta <coughs> refused for other reasons. That's a commercial lab, standard commercial lab. Because? Well, I'll read you the refusal letter. <laughs> no, I taught you particularly the University of Georgia. Oh, the University of Georgia is because that these people were using it for creationist purposes, and therefore this was a... a a prostitution of science, or uh, I've got, they, they didn't use okay. quite that. <laughs> what? Yeah, it was, it was a misuse, of, a horrible misuse. Of, um, uh, I mean, a morally reprehensible misuse of science. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's gotten very interesting. That's why the comment at the end where I said we may have to do our own stuff is because the era of cooperation 
is closing. I don't know whether it's completely closed, and I'm working on whether it is, but I can tell you that if you approach most uh, carbon-14 labs with, well, can you do this kind of stuff? You'll get one of two reactions. The first one is, how dare you? Uh, the second one is, well, we're concerned because if we get old ages, then you won't want to do any more if you get, you know, infinite age. And if we get, and, we, if, if, and that's what we'll probably get, but if we get finite ages, people will think our laboratory is no good. No, I mean, that's the nuts and bolts of what, uh, what Beta has said. Well then, is the information uh, you you gave a little while ago, I was unaware of, is that widely accepted, that there is carbon-14 in these old samples? It is widely accepted that there is carbon-14 in the old samples. The question is, what's causing it? Most of the time, it's blamed for, to laboratory error, and if you talk to Irv Taylor, that's what he'll tell you. But some of the data is secure enough to where the people who really know say that isn't a good enough explanation. <coughs> and so the explanation that you get is that, well, it must have been contaminated. Well, it must have been because it's old enough it shouldn't be there, and so it must have gotten in there later. I mean, what other explanation is there? Um, the idea that it's residual activity just simply is a non-starter because that trashes the entire standard geologic time scale. The, uh, the other explanation is it's being made by neutrons underground. Nobody's done a quantification as to how many neutrons it takes and whether there are that many neutrons around. Well, I shouldn't say that. Nobody has because uh, both um, both Baumgartner's group and I went through the calculations, and independently before that, there was two papers in the, in the nuclear physics journals discussing how many neutrons it would take, and it turns out that you would need about a million times as many neutrons as you currently have now. Uh, it's not gonna work. But you see, for these people, they're not giving these explanations to actually explain. They're giving them the explanations for intellectual cover. And I'll explain to you why, what I mean by that, okay? I once had a discussion with somebody who was proposing that the flood was really the Black Sea filling up, okay? Um, that, the, that the Dardanelles came and they just, you know, flooded into the area. And so I said, well, so which parts of the uh, count do you believe in which count, which parts do you think are, um, let's say, later additions or, you know, that kind of thing. And so he, he uh, well, so we went through, and so then I told the story based on what he said. Uh, and then I said, you know, there's an easy way to find this out. If you are correct, that there should be a hill with human habitations that is now an underwater hill that's uh, about 22 meters below the surface. So we should go and look for that in the Black Sea. Because the Bible says it covered the thing to 15 cubits, right? So, I mean, it's a simple matter. You just go down there and you look for something that's 15 cubits down below the surface, or, you know, 16, 14, you know, if it was 10 or 20, it doesn't matter. I mean, anything close to that, I mean, be, that'd be good enough. And so, you know, the ark floats off. Hey, if it was 40 and the guy missed it, you know? I mean, after all, some of the other details are a little exaggerated. So all you have to do is you find a little, and all of a sudden, he turned cold feet because he wasn't interested in testing his hypothesis. He was interested in being able to take the flood story off the table for, you know, a worldwide flood. You see, and this is what I mean by they're looking for intellectual cover, they're not actually looking for 
a, a, you know, a true scientific hypothesis that has consequences that you can test. See, and I'm doing it the opposite way. I'm looking at, you know, if there really was a flood, and if this stuff is only 5,000 years old, it hasn't had time for all the carbon-14 to decay, um, what kind of expectation do we have for carbon-14 in very old material, in stuff that people would say is millions of years old? And the answer is, well, you don't know for sure. Maybe there was rapid decay and it would get rid of it. This is my fault. Let me just shut him up. There. Uh, but, um, <coughs> but there's a... Uh, the rapid decay um, would, would, would get rid of all the carbon-14. But if there wasn't rapid decay and it was really a matter of, uh, you know, lots of carbon-12 uh, in the atmosphere at the time, uh, diluting the carbon-14 out, you might be able to find a little bit. So I said we should start looking. So the first thing you do is you survey the literature. The next thing you do is you do some experiments. <coughs> the next thing you do is you find out that some of the things that were being done inspired some other people to do experiments on dinosaur bones. And I think we should keep going. Because I think it's fun. And furthermore, right now we're winning, so why shouldn't we keep going? <laughs> you know, I mean, if it's really <coughs> there, then it will continue to be there as we keep going. Hello. Paul? I, I might add, uh, Jack raises the question, you know, why isn't this not more well known? Um, it's, it's very hard to get ideas out. Uh, Bob Brown started this thing uh, way back there and then suggesting it in some of the uh, articles in Origins. And then uh, Paul Gim, uh published the classic uh, report on it where he had uh, about 80, 90 examples. Whoever that guy was. And only one of them, uh, only one of them uh, possibly might not have had any carbon-14 in it. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and then uh, I put it in a chapter in uh, the book in the beginning, uh, uh, edited by Ball. Yeah, it's gone out through the, the regular creationist community, I just, non-Adventist. I published it last there. week, last month, in, uh, in College and University Dialogue, uh, including your article uh, uh, mentioned in there. But uh, it's not a popular ID, and it's not popular to date those things because it takes so terrible long to do it. Well, the and other thing is that time. every time you do one, it's cost you 500 bucks a pop, and somebody has to spring mm. for that. Yes. Uh, but uh, I think it's a, a valid argument that needs more emphasis. Yeah. Well, anyway, come back next week, and we will talk about the moving target. The KBS Tough and the case of Skull 4, uh, 1470.